Welcome to Vacation Station, hosted by Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazines.com. Welcome to our International Food, Wine, Travel Writers Association second Friday Big Blend Radio Vacation Station Travel Show. Today, travel writer Alan Cox is joining us to talk about Vancouver's amazing wilderness adventures, and his article will be in the August-September issue of Parks and Travel magazine. And, you know, it's really good to have Alan back on the show. Alan is the editor-in-chief at Northwest Travel and Life magazine. Uh, definitely check it out. Go to nwtravelmag.com. He's also the author of two Falcon guidebooks on day hiking. He's like Nancy and I. He likes to take one-hour walks, easy walks, and get out into the wild. Uh, he's got Best Easy Day Hikes Seattle and Best Easy Day, Hi day Hikes Tacoma. And he also serves as the chair of the Travel and Words Conference and is vice president of the International Food Wine Travel Writers Association, who we call IFTWA. And you can go to their website, ifwtwa.org, especially if you're a travel writer, photographer, uh, definitely a good resource. But good to have you back, Alan. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's good to be here again. I know we're excited about this. You know, Nancy and I are going through the photos, and we're excited about this because there's something about getting out into the wilderness, and um, you've got photos of bears, and I uh, and I know that you weren't doing like the extra crazy, you know, climb to the peak of the mountain with ropes and chains, right? <laughs> to, to no, that is that's exactly right. I I believe that wilderness travel uh, anybody can do. You don't have to be. Um, you know, extremely fit to do it. You can uh, be just the average person who wants to get away and see the outdoors and see what's in it. Um, and, uh, you know, far away from civilization. So it's accessible really to anybody. Well, you know, you're one of the inspirations for, for our one hour walk hiking group or walking group um, on Facebook. And everybody hashtag one hour walk or just type in one hour walk dot com for that because it was it really was through that one conversation we had with you and some other conversations that you know we realized people going into national parks i know we talked about this before sometimes think that they have to be this you know big avid you know athlete to be able to get out there you know and that's not true and as our travels and your travels have shown and proven that you could be on an, an even a handicap accessible trail to see the world's largest trees or you could be in the Everglades taking a nice easy stroll or you could even be on a stroller or a, a, a wheelchair and you can see an alligator right up close. So these, these places exist and that's what I'm really excited about this. Um, Vancouver Island is where you went for these adventures, right? Yes, yeah, so I go to Vancouver Island pretty frequently, as often as I can because it's one of my favorite places for uh, an outdoor adventure or wilderness adventure. And uh, the places on Vancouver Island are so um, accessible and really not that far away. The island is only 290 miles long, uh, for those who aren't familiar with it. It's got a little bit of everything uh, that the Northwest offers. It's sort of quintessential Northwest. It's got mountains. It's got, you know, it's surrounded by sea, obviously, and some outer islands, old growth forests that are ancient. Um, and it is... Uh, underneath the island is about um, 2,500 miles, I believe, of caves, most of which are unexplored. So if you're into spelunking, that is um, that should be a real draw. Wow, that is cool, wow. man. That's exciting. And then, you know, the, the, hmm. looking at that, and I know that you just came back from Whidbey Island in Washington, uh, yeah. where the uh, the IFTWA conference just happened. I know that from what I've heard, and like Linda Kassam was just on the show, and she was talking about it, like you really kicked butt with this conference as you did the last time. Um, but does the scenery kind of compare similar? Like when I was looking at the photos of sunrises mm -hmm. and sunsets and water and kayaking and paddle boarding, it seems that this could be a destination if you go to Vancouver, you could go to Whidbey and, and both or, or not. <laughs> Yes, it's Vancouver Island and Whidbey Island, of course, are both Northwest Islands, so they have that kind of scenery in common. But Whidbey Island is a little more, is a little gentler, a little more agricultural. There's not as much wild space, but there is still old growth forests and lots of parkland set aside for people to enjoy that. Um, when you get up to Vancouver Island, you can get into some real wild areas and not see very many people at all. Uh, and that's, that's one of the things that attracts me about it. But I want to be clear that um, when I do wilderness travel, I still like to sleep in a bed. 
uh, that's that's definitely something that is doable uh, in a place like Vancouver Island. If you stay at a wilderness lodge, you don't have to backpack, you don't have to camp out. And if you want to do that, you can, but it's not mm -hmm. required for those who are a little bit spoiled like me. See, I like that too, because I now appreciate a nice, clean bed, a nice little room, and a shower. And cocktails. And, and, and cocktails, <laughs> right. All of those are essential. And uh, exactly. But, uh, you know, for those who aren't familiar with Vancouver Island, it's, it's important to know the lay of the land a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, Victoria sits on the southern end of the island, and that, of course, is the big city there, and it's the capital of British Columbia. A gorgeous city to visit on its own, but it's a great launch pad for your wilderness adventures on the island. So I would always suggest spending a couple of days in Victoria to check it out, check out the attractions, and then go from there. Uh, and so that's on the southern part of the island. And when you get into uh, the more adventure opportunities, you're going to the north end of the island, which is, you know, a couple hundred miles north, and uh, over to the west coast, which is um, the part that's on the Pacific, and it's very wild and largely undeveloped over there as well. So those are really the two best places. In addition to that, the island groups in the inside passage that uh, separate Vancouver Island from the mainland are easily accessible from Vancouver Island and offer a lot of uh, wilderness adventure opportunities. And that's some of the uh, you know things I want to talk about today. It, it takes place in that area too. I'm excited about this because we just did, it was the Whitby series of you know, interviews we've done and, and mm -hmm. you know, articles we've run talking about, you know, you know, George Vancouver, Captain George Vancouver. And then Lynn Burroughs is uh, one of our writers um, out of Norfolk, England, and he always connects people in history to their family history back in Norfolk. And Captain George Vancouver comes from King's Lynn, where he was born, and he just came oh. back last year from... Was it, I might have the years wrong, but he went there to Vancouver Island uh -huh. to see the statue there, and because he has one in King's Lynn, and they're each facing each other, like, you know, King's Lynn statue of George Vancouver is facing Vancouver, and the one in Vancouver is facing King's Lynn, or oh, towards that, and they're interesting. looking at each other. But um, <laughs> just really understanding this voyage that he went on, you think back to, you know, the 1500s, and he was charting the Northwest Passage. Right. And out to Vancouver. And you're talking about how a lot of these places are just so quiet and, and desolate and not as many people. And, mm -hmm. uh, un, you know, uh, you know, not all the caves have been explored. And looking at some of your images, I'm going, this really makes me feel like, you know, you could be Captain George. Out there, well, you it's, know? I don't know about that, but it's very interesting you say that because there is a place uh, in the Inside Passage that Captain Vancouver went to and explored and was not very impressed with it because there was nothing there. Uh, and he named it Desolation Sound. And that's one of the places that I want to talk about today that's absolutely fabulous to uh, to um, explore. Oh, I like this. Wow. Now, one thing you'd mention is... Um, the importance of a guide, which is something Nancy and I have learned as well, because we mm -hmm. feel like you get to understand what oh, you're yeah. looking at and how well, the ecosystem well, yes. works. Absolutely. There are a couple of reasons for a guide. One is safety. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, it, unless you're an experienced wilderness guide yourself, it's really comforting and, and good to be in the hands of an expert who can, you know, look out for your well-being and keep you safe and give you tips on staying safe. Uh, that's very important when you're doing something like bear watching. Uh, for example. Um, but uh, also, you know, like you said, they have access to places that you might not normally have access to and can get you there and can get you in and out, um, which is very, um, very important. So I always, when I go to the wilderness, uh, I prefer to have a guide. It's just the way to go. Mm. You've learned so much more, too. Well, you do. They're They're usually they're usually experts in what you're looking at, whether it's wildlife, whether it's the ecosystem. Um, they are the experts in, in that, and you learn a ton uh, by the time you're finished with that trip. 
Oh man, you get so much more out of and, it. And you're hooked on this place. Obviously mm -hmm. you said you keep going back there. And so that knowledge just keeps compiling and compiling. So you start to understand all the ecosystems. Um, one of the photos, well too, I love the bear, right? No, so tell us about the bear and how small human hands are compared to their paw prints. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a very interesting trip and one of my favorites. Uh, and we didn't just see bears on that trip. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you everything we saw, mm -hmm. but there, that was a place, um, in the Inside Passage uh, called Broughton Archipelago. And it's an island group that's between North Vancouver Island and the mainland. And the part of the mainland that is that it is near is the Great Bear Rainforest. It's very wild, it's real back country. Um, a lot of it is uh, First Nations land, and so you really need permission to have access to it. Well, I went on a trip uh, where the guide was the owner of Farewell Harbor Lodge on a little island called Barry Island. And it's the only thing on that island. Uh, and, you know, he has a boat. He takes you out uh, in one of his boats uh, to either look at wildlife from the water or, if you're a little more adventuresome, uh, hit the land uh, and uh, hike in to see the bears on foot. So it's funny because when he gave, I was with a, you know, there were other people on the tour as well who I didn't know. And he asked uh, everybody their preference, you know, do you prefer a boat tour to see the bears from a little greater distance or do you want to get up close and personal with them? And before I had a chance to raise my hand and say, uh, we want to do this by boat, everyone opted for the, the hike in. So there I was. And uh, I was a good sport. I did it, and I'm glad I did because it was one of the best wildlife experiences I've had. Uh, we we took a boat into this beautiful uh, inlet, and uh, just you know uh, got in the zodiacs from the main boat. Um, you know, shuttled over to the beach, got out, and uh, he knew the trails. And oddly, this man who owns um, Farewell at Harbor Lodge, the guide, hasn't worn shoes in two years. He prefers to go barefoot. And there he was, yep, way. He was there in the wilderness, completely barefoot, on the beach, on the trails, everywhere, not wearing shoes. And he, I thought it was very odd. And he said, that's, that's just his preference. But uh, there, he's leading us in with his, with his co-guide. And uh, we are on the trail. And he, tell, he told us, he gave us instructions to stay close together, uh, especially if he gives us a signal to huddle together and then do so because that means a bear is present and it's best if we're in a, a really tight group. And we're on the trail. And this is this is brown bear country, a grizzly country, and <laughs> we're rounding this little bend and this head pops up just about five feet from us on the other side of these shrubs, these you know these wild shrubs, and it was a bear that was sleeping on the trail. And we startled the bear more than he startled us, and he sort of made a grunt and ran off the other direction. But he was very close to us. And uh, so we all kind of got our stuff together after that, you know, from the adrenaline rush, and continued on the trail and found a little place that was a knoll over this river where the, the bears like to come and fish for salmon. And we all just huddled on this knoll kind of behind some brambles, and we were about 20 feet from the bears. And so the photo you saw that I took uh, was of that bear that we saw that day. We were there for about an hour and a half, and the bear knew we were there. He was just kind of parading back and forth, marking his territory, as they do, and just showing us that we were in his house. And he was not aggressive. He was not... Um, threatening in any way but the guides were very vigilant and you know they had bear spray handy and noisemakers handy and that kind of thing if they needed it but they never needed it they just gave us instructions to lay low and take as many pictures as we wanted and just be quiet and that's what we did for an hour and a half it was fantastic oh and i love i love that you got to spend the time just you know relaxing and watching and having that moment because I think a lot of people get scared, they freak mm -hmm. out, or don't. Sometimes you're with people that don't want to sit and just watch. Because to me, this is, you know, you never yeah. know when you're never going to see this kind of thing again. You know, this well, I don't want to lie. You said you mentioned the word relax. I don't know if I was relaxed for a moment during that hour and a half. Because, <laughs> because if you've never had that experience before, you don't know what the behavior is likely yeah. to be. And, yeah. uh, and it was fine. It turned out to be fine in hindsight. You know, I could have been relaxed. The bear certainly was. 
Um, <laughs> so I just get excited. The, the ones in the sequoias that we came across, a mom with two bears, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and it was in the fall, and they and and it was they were doing the government shutdown, and we had a feeling it was going to happen, so we rushed back to the park while we were out traveling out there, and lo and behold, we hear this scratching and scratching and this big, I mean, really like huge sounds, and they were scratching on the dead logs. They were getting ready for hibernation because it was fall. Mm -hmm. And they're getting all the mud grubs or whatever you call them, the bugs out of the, the bark. Mm -hmm. And everyone thinks, oh, a dead tree. Well, this is like a massive food force for the bears. Right. And so we're filming and all of a sudden here comes the mom with the two babies. And we're like, dude, no way. <laughs> and then later, and that adrenaline rush that you talk about, because then we're like, oh, let's try and film it. And then we're like, dude, no way, hang back. And then it was like, oh, man, there's this, there is nothing like that wildlife encounter mm. i know it's it true it does help to have a guide because then you know how to behave and mm -hmm. right. even though you may be nervous it that's about truly living now we're truly living there's nothing like that moment You're well truly it's true alive. and the guide also knows where to find the wildlife usually um where i by myself would not and they, and i also wouldn't know how to behave if i ran across a brown bear like that by myself and uh so i i did feel really safe in the hands of that guide. But the interesting thing is about that Farewell Harbor Lodge trip is the guide then, when we got back in the boat, um, shuttled us around um, all over the place, really, in the Broughton Archipelago. And we saw everything but a unicorn that day. We saw uh, humpback whales. Um, we saw orcas, two pods of orcas. We saw a brown bear. We saw elk. Um, we saw uh, porpoises. We saw everything. And uh, and we were saying, well, you know, we don't want to go back until we see the unicorn, but he, he couldn't promise that. Okay, but now the lodge there, because I was looking at photos of the lodge, I mean, to uh -huh. me, like, it's nice and remote, and this is it on the island. And when right. you have that kind of seclusion, um, then wildlife starts to be part of your, co there's coexistence that happens. Exactly. And did you stay, at, did you get to stay overnight there or did you? I did, yes. Yeah. So I stayed at the lodge for a few days. It was fantastic. Uh, it was a good experience. They have individual cabins that are completely, um, you know, along a boardwalk uh, over the water that are, are completely um, comfortable. And they have the main lodge with, you know, the big fireplace and living room and dining room. And their meals were fantastic. Um, you know, they have a chef on board and, uh, and in the evening, uh, you know, we ate with the guides, uh, who are also the owners, and uh, just had a conversation about what we saw that day and learned a little bit more about the First Nations people in the area, who he has a really good relationship with to be able to actually go where we went, because otherwise he would not be allowed there. Um, you know, so it was, uh, it, that's another reason to have a guide is the accessibility to place. Um, and so the evening, you know, entertainment was wine uh dinner and uh talking with the uh with the wildlife experts were the stars amazing out there because it feels so remote that you wouldn't have you know polluted skies at night they were they were amazing i mean it's often cloudy up there so we were lucky uh to have the stars and you know i was saying we were lucky to see all the animals that we saw we were also lucky to see the stars oh. now, yeah it was beautiful I want to go back to the barefoot hiking because yeah. <laughs> I find this, there's the whole barefoot society. Okay. There is. And I find it very, I'm, I'm into it. I haven't done it for a while, but you know, growing up in, in South Africa, there was a thing because of Shaka Zulu, you know, he, yeah. he uh -huh. trained as a so military and yeah. running and getting thorns and running over hot coals, the whole right. thing so that you would have really thick soles. And so that, you know, they could outrun the British. Mm -hmm. And uh, the mm -hmm. boars and do this, and mm -hmm. they kicked butt doing it. But then uh, a friend of ours, Robin Easton, um, she she went and as a young lady went out to the Daintree Rainforest in Australia, mm -hmm. and she lived out there in the wild. Uh, wrote a book about it, and everyone, it's amazing. Uh, just Google Robin Easton, and uh, mm -hmm. she is a barefoot hiker, and she mm -hmm. learned to literally live with the snakes the scorpions the spiders mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter how venomous she got to this point and there's a thing about being barefoot and and i mm -hmm. really want to go back to that i know we're in the desert where we have like rattlesnake paths you know she's not far from us in santa fe but there's you know you have to be aware and i think that's the beauty of it is that you 
are incredibly more aware if you're barefoot versus having shoes. I'm not saying everyone should do it, but you are no. you right. become incredibly aware about where you put your feet and what you're doing and it's a different level. And I'm not saying again that's for everyone, but it's interesting and mm -hmm. I I I aspire to be like that one day. <laughs> yeah. I think this I think in this case this gentleman's um motive was as you say, you know, you're more aware of where you put your feet, but also just a more um, a direct connection with nature. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think that's where he was coming from. I th I th he didn't talk a lot about it. He did wear flip flops for dinner out of respect for the guests. But I think that's dress shoes for him. Mm. You know, when you go to the beach, you walk down oh. the coastline and in a little bit of water, you let the waves come over your feet, mm -hmm. you walk barefoot. You know, and and that seems normal and natural to us. Mm -hmm. But then when you, if you go to the desert, now that's another thing. So the mountains is really another thing because of all the rocks and, and all right. that. Right, but you so, understand it. Yeah. But, but there is something about walking on the coastline where mm -hmm. you can feel nature like up close and personal through your feet, mm -hmm. which is the way you're connected to the ground. So right. I, I think barefoot hiking is something to think about, but I also think that um, you need to be prepared. You can't just, no, like, don't do it. I, I wouldn't do it in the desert No. Um, until you've done it on the beach a few times. No, no, there's a, there's a, you, have to, you have to build up to it. I used to be, you know, as a performer back in the day, I took, I, it was really not as good as a performer as a singer unless I took my shoes off and it felt more real like you can mm. feel the vibrations come through and yeah. I can't explain it but it it, mm. it just yeah. I felt more grounded mm -hmm. and more at ease and if I had shoes on I'm like I'm gonna hurt myself well, I think <laughs> the, yeah the reasons people do it are probably very personal you know and I expect it's that was neat. the case with this guy it's neat it's neat mm -hmm. so I, I this whole thing of being able to also be out and in uh, with you know in the First Nations, I want to touch back to that because yes. over here in Arizona, um, in Tucson, we we were surrounded by the Tohoto uh, Odom Nation and um, mm -hmm. you know some of the areas out here. Is some, like Yuma, Arizona, you've got the Tohoto Odoms. You also have um, the Kashans and the Kokopa Indians and uh -huh. circling that city. And so there's this it's it's you know you can do some things, some things not. Um, some of the tribal land connects with the uh, either like a national wildlife refuge or right. you know things like that or blm land so when you say first nations that's a little different than what we're hearing down here well in canada that's the um oh. the term basically for uh the native okay. population is, for, is they call them first nations and so there are various first nations groups uh you know throughout canada uh, just like there are tribes um in the united states mm -hmm. so yeah it's the same sort of thing and uh and it's a very rich um, heritage on Vancouver Island, not and on the mainland too, but on Vancouver Island, uh, it's very rich, very preserved. Uh, I met people there who are master carvers who still carve totem poles and and fantastic pieces of art, masks, that sort of thing that harken back to traditional design and keeping that tradition and you know that artistry alive, which is very very important. Otherwise, if those people didn't do that, it would be lost. Um, but yeah. up up north of uh, on the island is a place as a town called Port Hardy. It's the biggest city up there, but it also is an excellent place to visit for wildlife adventures, because up there 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 are various tour guides. I mean, you can get so many, you know, find so many guides up there. But one that I particularly like is Cove Adventure Tours, because Cove Adventure they're a hiking tour company. And they will take you to places that are not normally accessible and that you would not want to drive your rent-a-car. Um, and so, uh, you know, they, they will drive you back um, across the island to the Pacific side where there are isolated beaches, um, coves, caves, you know, sea caves, old growth forests that you hike through. And it's a day trip. And I would recommend that for anybody um, they say that really one of their biggest tourism markets, uh, you know, coming in to visit Vancouver Island for that sort of experience is Germans. Um, the Germans seem to, as, as travelers, they seem to love the outdoors, they love the wilderness, and they love the American and Canadian West. And uh, they walk through those old growth forests and they say, 
we didn't know anything like this still existed in the world. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. And uh, the trees are enormous there. I sent you a photo of, of one cedar tree that mm -hmm. is kind of typical, a typical example of what you see. But uh, it was pouring down rain the day I did that hike, torrential. And we had rain gear on. I think I got soaked through my rain gear. Uh, and it never let up. And we finally, when we got to the beach, which, which we didn't mind because you're in a rainforest. So it's part of the beauty, right? Mm -hmm. When we got to the beach, there was a sea cave that we went into. And we, could st we started a fire in there. We were dry. We were warm. We had lunch. We had our picnic in there and looked out at the surf and, and the headlands and the ocean and the, uh, and the beautiful sea stacks and just kind of spent the afternoon in this cave. Uh, and then hiked back in the rain. We didn't really want to tear ourselves out of that cave, but we did. And um, you know, when did you like go there? Like we're the first people on earth. You I know yeah. exactly. You do feel like the yeah. last person on earth when you're there. Yeah. And then Sid Bad is going to come through. No, but I just think it's so Sorry. cool to to connect that way with nature and with with our history mm. of who was where, what time. Okay, there's dates and all that, but and that's good to know that stuff. Right. But I think it's really better to sit in a cave and build your own fire and kind of just um, feel like where we came from. Yeah. That's it's awesome. it's sort of primal, actually. Yeah. You know, even if you're a tourist with rain gear on and, you know, your REI equipment, it's still primal. It's awesome. It's awesome. I, I love this. And in the rain part, I mean, so you got to be prepared and have rain gear. Um, right. But there's something about really being part of the element. And I think that's what's so neat about nature. You never know when you're going to go out, when the weather's going to change. Yes. In fact, um, I have to laugh because the song we chose for you today at the end of our conversation is called Before the Rain Falls. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, well it's, it's, it's written out of Oregon. So, uh, from right, Georgia, right. Uh, but I had to do that. But this is so neat that these experiences happen. And I think that's what's magical about being out in the wilderness. You never know what you're going to mm -hmm. see, what you're going to experience. And again, like you say, having a guide. The one thing we've learned with guides is they will take you to places just to, that will help you in taking photos as well did you have you experienced that with guides too that can go here this is the, the best look you know this is the best I have look. yes yes I in fact I've been on wilderness photo tours and you know I'm not necessarily a star graduate but uh, it was really informative and I did learn a lot uh, you know from expert photographers who specialize in uh, you know, wildlife pictures. I, I I swear I can't take a picture of a whale because by the time I click, you know, my camera, they're underwater again. So I struggle with that. But the experts can do it and they can teach you how to do it and uh, or at least how to try and do it. Um, and it's very valuable to do that. You just it's practice a, and keep going a, back. <laughs> you know what I think? There, there's an instinct to it of clicking before the animal is about to do what it's about to do. Right, you have to anticipate. And you do, and you have to, if you watch an animal for, as a wildlife artist, I spent lots of hours observing animals, and mm -hmm. uh, I learned to, uh, okay, they have a pattern, they've done it two, three times, next time, click just before you think you should click, and right. then you'll get it. Mm -hmm. It's, it's just an instinct thing after a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, well, I haven't quite picked up on it yet, but I know people do. And uh, and they have they take fantastic photos of these animals. But um, it's, it's neat to have those guys. I really, I just love that you talk about that because mm -hmm. I think so many times, you know, especially, you know, people, you know, an experience is an experience. Whether you're a world traveler or this is your one big vacation every five years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. when you go, make the most out of it. Yeah. So that you really understand the place and get that feel for it. And that's what guides do. They mm -hmm. explain the sense of place. They explain that whole atmosphere of, you know, even that plant and why that plant mm -hmm. is there for the exactly. bear or this or that, you know. Exactly. I mean, it's, it's so cool, especially in nature. What, what I want to go back is the, the paddling and the boating. Um, one of the photos you sent us is you have a, um, like a little dinghy boat thing. And people are getting ready to get on or off, and yes. people are photographing on the side. So, did you see tide pools? Was was, was that in, around? In that or? in that area, not specifically. It was a little um, the the environment really wasn't um, 
tide pooly. It was more muddy. And uh, but there are places where you can go, you know, on that island to see fantastic tide pools. And typically they're over on the west coast um, near Tofino. And I don't know if you've ever been to Tofino or know much about it, but it's it's quite an up and coming destination. But it is in the mil- middle of the wilderness, um, and it's uh, near Pacific Rim National Park, which is very wild, very beautiful, a lot of animals uh, like bear, and um, also a lot of surfers. Um, so oh. it's become sort of a surfing a surfing mecca. Um, it's a it's a great place to go, and I particularly like it because there is um, a tour company there that's uh, run by the First Nations group in that area called Tashi Paddling School or Paddle School, and what they will do is take you out in a traditional um, longboat canoe that's that's carved from one cedar log, mm-hmm. and they'll take you out paddling in the wilderness in that, and then they take you to. Um, you know, across the sound and onto a trail which goes into a, an ancient forest, and it's a fantastic experience as well. And it's just a day trip, you know. You can these are these easy trips that you can experience something magical and magnificent. Those cedar trees, that photo you're talking about, they, I mean, to me, they an old growth is so. I mean, so many people are getting into forest bathing. This is the way to go, especially if it rains. Exactly. But, right. But there's a, there's a, we, part of our DNA is tree. So just saying, everyone, it's our brothers and sisters that we're walking through. You know, that's right. Well, I'm glad you way. mentioned forest bathing because that's all part of this experience. And there's uh-huh. no better place to do it than Vancouver Island. Wow. Wow. Because that, that theater was so big. It, it I'm, when we lived in Southern California up in the mountains, we had cedar trees, and mm-hmm. um, there's this one place, Palomar Mountain, that has mm-hmm. redwoods, which you wouldn't think in Southern California. They have the only stretch out there, and um, then having spent time in the sequoias, and you have those giant sequoia trees, and I was looking at the cedar, I just immediately, not, I mean, I know better, but I immediately thought this was like a giant sequoia. They were so big. Mm-hmm. That's a big tree. I mean, yeah. it is almost like a sequoia at that point. You know, and it's daunting to think how old they are, too. You know, yeah. I mean, a thousand years old or more, 2,000. Yeah. So it's uh, it's know. pretty incredible to be in their midst, actually. It's humbling. Yeah, they know. They The trees know everything. The trees and the rocks and the mountains, I always believe they know. Like, they, if we could, like, really hear their secrets, like, we'd hear, like, who did what where in the forest, you know? Right, <laughs> What's right. been going on over the years? Yeah. And it, this is just, and I love this, again, about mm. making it... This is something that people can easily go out and do and do these day trips and, you know, caves. That's something that I do hear about people going into, wanting to explore caves. And I've, I've done a few caves. We did that one mm-hmm. Coronado National mm-hmm. Memorial out here, and, and mm-hmm. it's trippy. I mean, it's, it is. It's, it's trippy. Did you it's do not it? necessarily an easy environment to get through. Um, but if you have a guide, again, that is you know an experienced caver he can tell you he or she can tell you what to touch what not to touch because our you know the oils on our hands can be harmful to the the growth the mineral growth that kind of thing in the caves so they tell you what to touch what not to touch where to watch for um, animals that might be hanging around like bats that are fabulous to see and uh, you know they can talk about that that fragile environment and it really is fragile uh, and one of my favorite places to do that is Lauren Lake Caves on Vancouver Island. And it's not necessarily wilderness. It's back, you know, it's back in the forest. You have to go on a pretty gnarly, you know, dirt road to get there. But uh, it has, you know, um, a visitor center where they give you the proper equipment and set you up with a guide. And then you hike into a number of, you know, you have a variety of caves you can choose from. Uh, but one I went on was really just an easy couple hour hike in the cave uh and it was really fantastic um i'm a fairly big guy and i have to say that my coat got shredded going through a cheese grater in the cave but you know i survived gave me something to talk about had to buy a new coat but (laughs) nonetheless it was a fantastic experience and it was beautiful in there Oh man, this I want to go. Mm. So this is the other question is, you know, when we, we think about Canada or the Pacific Northwest, it's like oh, only go in the summer. Is that true? No, it's not true. Um, one of the, I mean, some operators, you know, tour operators or guides only operate on season, but you can have great experiences 
uh, in the winter too. Of course, we're you know if you're a skier, it's not necessarily wilderness adventure, but you know there's helicopter skiing, there's ski resorts all over the place. There's um, there's winter storm watching on the coasts. Uh, so you know winter is definitely a time to get out. I'm glad we talked about that because mm -hmm. I think that's the same thing that happens. I know when you were on our show last time talking about all the different national parks, you know, in, mm -hmm. in the Northwest. And right. it's like even Yosemite, Yellowstone, it's go in the winter. It's so magical and quiet and peaceful. It is. And it's a different thing that happens. And, right. There are fewer and people. You'll get hotel yeah. reservations easier. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it is, and it is different. It is more magical, especially if there's snow um, or a storm. One of my favorite times to go hiking here, you know, out, um, out on the beach in the Olympic National Park uh, in that area is, is November or December. You know, the mm. weather's not necessarily good. There might be a windstorm. It's beautiful. It's a great mm. place. To, it's a great time to go. Um, there, there's another experience I wanted to tell you about if we have time that is also a wilderness experience, but it's a little different because you're sort of in the, the lap of comfort the whole time. And that is on an interesting tour, a week-long tour, I took um, off of Vancouver Island into Desolation Sound that is on Marine Link Tours. And Marine Link is a heavy equipment delivery vessel. Um, the Aurora Explorer is their boat. Okay. And they make week-long trips up into the wilderness to logging camps. You, you really don't see towns or cities. Um, they, they go up these long, mountainous inlets uh, they're basically fjords, absolutely beautiful to deliver equipment and, uh, you know, trees for reforestation, uh, that kind of thing. They deliver all that stuff. And you go along as a passenger, and they take 12 wow. passengers at a time. So one of the decks on the vessel is a pa the passenger deck. Um, you have a stateroom. It's very comfortable. Uh, they have ample uh, bathrooms uh, so that you, you know, have that sort of comfort. They have fantastic meals three times a day and, even better, a wine hour and uh, before dinner. So that's really fun. And the entertainment is just what you see out the windows oh, or wow. when you get to land on the beach or something and, and take a, a hike. And uh, it's a fantastic experience. It's, it's a very unusual cruise mm -hmm. because of the vessel and what the vessel is doing. It's definitely not your, your average cruise ship. But that's a wilderness experience as well because of where you go. You, I would never have an opportunity to go to these remote inlets in Desolation Sound, you know, unless I had my own sailboat and plenty of time. And that's a way to access that. And you're with experts. You can spend mm -hmm. as much time on the bridge with a captain as you want, chatting about the vessel, about what he does for a living, about the place. He knows the environment. He knows the place. And um, it's fascinating. Wow, and one of that. your photos is like mm. a waterfall is hitting it, like yeah. hitting off yeah. the deck. <laughs> That's how they wash the deck. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> he, yeah, he pulled right up to a waterfall and lowered the, um, you know, the deck that they load the equipment on, and uh, and just let the waterfall. It was a, you only saw a part of that waterfall in the in the photo. It was very mm -hmm. tall. And the water just crashes down on the deck, and that's one of the high entertainment days on the trip, um, wow. is watching the waterfall hit the boat. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Wow. How yeah. Neat. Well, you don't – yeah, cool. why not? So now I have to ask you, of all your experiences on Vancouver Island getting out into the wilderness, because of the one-hour walk, you know, you're part of this now. If you could take a one-hour walk anywhere on Vancouver Island, where would it be? And who do you want to spend that one hour walk with just to chat or, you know, they could be alive or pass on. Um, and what are you going to talk about? Cause we want gossip. Oh gosh. Well, so no, that's a really good, that's a really good question. Um, okay. I have to think of her name uh, for the person, but I think I would go to um, a place. I have to look at the map now. Names are escaping me, but um, near Souk, just past Souk, which is, west of Victoria on the water. Mm -hmm. If you keep driving, you come to a place that is known for its old growth forests. I would drive out there and take a one hour walk uh, through the forest. Um, and who I would want to go with is passed on, but um, it's an artist who lived on Vancouver Island. She was from Victoria and she's one of Canada's most famous artists. She was 
um, in the early 20th century, she was the equivalent of um, like the Fauves in France, like Cezanne or Matisse or something like that. Mm -hmm. And she was obsessed with the wilderness. Um, she would go out by herself um, up the coast to First Nations villages and hang out until they accepted her. She would um, paint their totem poles, you know, I mean, on canvas and uh, and the environment and the trees and the forest. And there's actually a novel about her um, called Forest Lover. If you ever want to read a good novel about that artist, and I'm trying to remember her name, and I'll Google it and find it. But um, oh, I've got it. Um, so the novel was by Susan Freeland. Yes. It was about Emily Carr. Emily Carr. Thank you. Uh, I know it as well as my own name, and I couldn't think of it. Um, Emily <laughs> Carr. That's who I would want to be with. Yeah, and she's from that area, so she's you know she's native there, and she's from Victoria. Very cool, very cool, and I I love it when people you know they know the an area there. There's that enthusiasm for it, and especially the wilderness side of it. That's awesome. So now I want to talk about IFTWA, the International Food Wine Travel Writers yeah. Association. This conference, I'm hearing so much. I mean, what give give us your take on it? Because I heard that your hand was in instrumental big time in regards to planning it and making things happen. Yeah, well, you know, I can't take much credit um, because Whidbey Island. Uh, tourism really stepped up to the plate on this one, and they, um, I have to tell you, I've never seen such a warm and widespread welcome from a, people in a place as they had for us. Uh, there were signs everywhere welcoming us. Uh, there were newspaper articles, you know, in their local newspapers saying that, you know, these, uh, these you know, world-renowned travel and food writers were coming to the island. They were very excited to have us. And so I have to say, uh, Sherry Wyatt, their their tourism director, really did so much legwork in in you know generating that kind of enthusiasm and welcome. And I have about 60 people on the island were instrumental in preparing for our visit or contributing in some way. So wow. it was it was really incredible. I've never quite seen anything like it. They were so um, happy to have us there, and we were happy to be there. They rolled out the welcome mat. Uh, and it was a, you know, it wasn't a long conference. It was basically two and a half days, but they rolled out a welcome reception the first night in their um, local yacht club. They had the commander of the Naval Air Station there speaking to us. They had wow. mayors. They had all kinds of officials uh, there welcoming us. The food and drink were fantastic. They had live music. It was incredible. And uh, the next day was our was our professional development day, which we had at Camp Casey. Uh, and that's a historic army base turned into a conference center uh, run by Seattle Pacific University. And so we used that facility. They did a top-notch professional job um, for our professional development day. And then the next day, we had an island tour, which uh, we all kind of divided up on buses and uh, had a tour itinerary, and it was excellent. We actually got to go... Uh, we got to do something that not a lot of people get to do, and that is actually go to Pen Cove Shellfish Farms, uh, which is a pretty renowned um, shellfish producer. And uh, we got to visit not only their uh, packing facility and distribution facility, which was very interesting, like a little field trip. We also got to get on a boat and go out to the mussel rafts where they grow the mussels in the harbor. And that was very interesting as well. So... And nobody gets to do that. So that we felt very special for having that experience. Um, Whidbey Island is no, it's becoming known for its its wineries, uh, and it actually grows some uh, and produces some pretty great wine. And we all divided up and went to lunches and winery tours at different wineries. And um, we saw whales in uh, Saratoga Passage. We saw gray whales uh, surfacing. So that was very exciting too. I was watching on social media and. And I remember, um, you know, with you and Sherry coming on the show discussing this is what's right. going to happen for the conference and, you know, and looking at the itinerary going like, dude, this is insane. Every writer mm. needs to be there. And so what was, the, what was the turnout like? Did you get new people coming in and going, hey, we want to be part of this and get part of the organization? And We did. We had, grow? we did. We had some new, we had some new members come. We had some people oh. who were not members because we opened it to non-members. And we had some, you know, old tried and true members uh, who'd been in the organization a long time come as well. Um, it was a fairly intimate conference. We uh, had 
I think with the tourism marketplace and all of the writer attendees, we had about 65 people. So it was fairly small, uh, but it was, it was perfect that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think so, yeah, it was really, it was really a, a, just a snapshot of what's going on in that island in terms of tourism, in terms of food, and in terms of uh, beverage production, mostly adult beverages. And uh, it's, it's a pretty happening place. It's an adult beverage destination, Nancy. Sounds good to it me. is. I, I it wanna, is. I Meet you there. This, um, because of you know being the editor of Northwest Travel and Life magazine, yeah. uh, which is beautiful, and everyone again, nwtravelmag.com. Um, Nancy, you know we we have this tourism series on hospitality and the importance of community and having community buy-in to tourism yes. and understanding what the community wants and, and building mm-hmm. tourism excellence that way. And she was doing all this research and um, said that Oregon is mm-hmm. right up there in leading um, really the excellence mode of understanding negatives and turning them into positives and mm-hmm. that Oregon is really hauling and they are. moving forward. Mm-hmm. They are. They're front runners. Travel Oregon um, is a front runner under the leadership of Todd Davidson uh, in, in um, really – uh, teaching everyone from the legislature on down the importance of tourism and uh, gaining funds for programs. They have put together some impressive programs in terms of things like um, scenic bike routes. And they have more scenic bike routes in that state than you can imagine. Of agritourism, you know, like food trails, uh, you know, wilderness access, all sorts of things. And they really have put themselves on the map as as just a, a prime destination. So other states, you know, in, in the U.S. really should be looking at them, um, yeah. you know, as a model. It's true because what they've done is totally duplicatable, you know, depending it is. on your destination. Um, you know, because when we travel around, go to some of the really smaller communities, they they always kind of have this idea that they can't do anything. Yeah, and it's it is not true. They have Oregon uh Travel Oregon has um you know, they have sort of grassroots seminars for tourism providers or businesses mm-hmm. in uh a location like a rural location to teach them uh what they should and can be doing and to help them put together a program, uh a tourism program to you know, that's mm-hmm. specifically customized for that community. They're very good at it and, and they're you know, they're very active with it. I love this too because it goes with I think even the title of your magazine, Northwest Travel and Life. Because yes. I don't think you can have travel without lifestyle and culture being connected. You know, right. that community part. I love right. that. It's part. it's true. And you know, we do we do in the magazine um it, it talk a lot about uh cultural aspects of the destinations, you know, that we talk about. Um as well as, you know, things like other other trends and other interesting you know things in the northwest architecture you know uh, food you know beverage all sorts of things that are that are trends not necessarily associated with the destination um and yeah. so it kind of gives you a flavor for the region i think well it makes you hungry when you go in there and it makes you want to go outdoors too so <laughs> uh, you've got good stuff going there so everybody again nwtravelmag.com and you do go all the way up to vancouver right <laughs> we do yes we we include um we include british columbia uh in in the mix uh also alaska washington oregon idaho and montana that's pretty much our geographic coverage area that's really sad you know, it's just, you know, you, why don't you just pick some of the most beautiful places in the world? You know? Well, you know, I, I know I, I, it's, it's funny because, you know, we've been we've been criticized by some other regional magazines in the country. Like, you know, they're like, uh, I don't want to name any regions, but places with flat landscapes, basically, they, they say, you know, come on, you, you cannot help but produce a beautiful magazine because of where you are. So we have to work at it. You don't. Um, Yeah, right. (laughs) I think every place has its unique character. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the desert, we I actually had a conversation. A friend of ours is a park ranger, and she said, you know, she was in D.C. and she was with a cab driver, Uber, Uber, whatever. And the guy was like, oh, I hate the south, you know, the desert. And she's like, well, have you been to Tucson, the Sonoran Desert? And he's like, no, like, but it's the desert. It's dry. And she's like, she wished she could show photos from our our one hour walk. Oh my God, yeah. 
because there's it's uniquely different. You have to look at little things, and then some things mm-hmm. are really big, like our saguaro cactus. You know. Well, the Sonoran it's, Desert around Tucson is one of the most beautiful places I've seen. I love it there. Oh, you got to come back. Yeah. We'll take you out for margaritas and a one-hour walk. Oh, okay, you know, I'm in. We went on our our little escapade. We had fun with the rattlesnake in a little oh, yeah. Ramada little thing. Little but Ramada you know that happens. But I had that experience there as well. Yeah, well, see, see, but but if you. In a couple of days, I'm going on a Windstar cruise uh, up the uh, coast of British Columbia into southeast Alaska. Uh, it's a 12-day cruise, so it really takes its time, and it goes to a lot of ports of call. So I'm very excited about that. And I, if I don't see whales, I'm going to be very disappointed. Oh, wow. This is not good. You will see whales. Cause you're I know I will. You, you well, it's also the right time of year for, for humpbacks. So... I'm hoping we get lucky and see a lot of them. Last time I was on a cruise up there uh, was with Alaskan Dream Cruises, which is a fantastic little cruise line. You know, fewer than 100 passengers on board. It's great. We were surrounded by humpback whales for a week. It was incredible. By the time the week was over, I thought I'd never do this, but people go, oh, there's whales. I'd go, eh, you know, that's okay. Eh." And uh, I never thought that would happen. But uh, you never really get tired of looking at them. You don't, you don't no. ever, it, there's something of nature is so magnificent and it's disappearing. That's a reality. Um, you know, the more human beings that are put on earth, the more right. we expand on, on land and yeah. you know, it's just the way things are going. And I'm not going to get into all that, but we mm-hmm. need to see what we can protect what we can and do what we can within our own neighborhoods too. just to not, we're on this mission of no dead zones allowed in communities. Plant right. native plants, create nature in your back door. Some of mm-hmm. you have whales, like, you know, Alan gets to enjoy. Uh, well, here's some of the, us have rattlesnakes. It's all good. Well, right. but it's all well here's the thing about what you're saying, too, and, and also using a guide on wilderness travel, is yeah. that usually the guides who are wilderness travel guides actually give back to conservation in a big way. They educate mm-hmm. people, um, you know, which is a free way to give back, but they also usually financially give back uh, Mm -hmm. from their proceeds to conservation efforts or their leading conservation efforts. So when you do business with these guides, you are doing your part to help the environment in in that way. And you're also Mm -hmm. learning a lot. So that's that's a really important point. And uh, you can choose who you do business with when you're traveling and to do business with a you know, an environmentally conscious um, organization that really values sustainability in whatever field they're in, I think is very important. And we all should be aware yeah. of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not to be on a soapbox. Sorry about that. No, 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 no. no but but we, we do it all the time I mean, because it's something to remember because yeah. we can talk about responsible tourism and sustainability, but as travelers, we need to look at how our actions impact the places we go. Exactly so right. I think it's a very important thing. It's a two-way street there. And uh, the more that we can do, and sometimes we're just unaware or forget, and uh, every reminder is a good reminder because, Mm -hmm. again, these special places, you want to be able to go back to Vancouver and see those whales again or Alaska and see those whales again. Exactly right. uh, Have you ever seen a polar bear in the wild? I have to ask you before you go. (laughs) I have, yes. I I saw one up at, uh, oh, I forget what they call the name of the city now, but um, it's... uh, Barrow, Alaska, um, and we saw one up there. But oh, uh, yeah, it, I, and I love the Arctic. That's a whole nother show. Oh yeah. wow, we'll come back because that that was such a good conversation. As always, Alan, just a pleasure having you on the show. And everybody, again, uh, keep up with Alan and, and the magazine. Go to nwtravelmag.com and uh, go to ifwtwa.org. If twas, we say. Uh, not only if you're a travel writer, photographer, food writer, wine writer, uh, cocktail writer, it don't matter if you're a mixologist, even get on board with it. You could be an author, a CVB or a destination, a marketing organization, a town, community. Uh, it, this is a place where everybody networks together in the world of good tourism, responsible tourism, and making things happen. You cannot have tourism without travel writers. It doesn't happen. No. Nope. Period. <laughs> Let's like, just sure. say it. That's my well, that's my quote true. of the day. Uh, so therefore, these organizations are important. And again, stay tuned for Alan's article 
Uh, it's going to be in the August-September issue of Parks and Travel magazine, preparing you for your fall-winter adventure in Vancouver, right? See, so you can do it. So do Vancouver it. Vancouver Island, uh, right. That's right. And the magazine is up on, on nationalparktraveling.com. And uh, for more on Canada, because we're starting to get more and more stories on Canada, and even would be that we're talking about, go to nationalparktraveling.com for that. But we want to thank all of our listeners for joining us for our second Friday show with IFTWA. And uh, don't forget, uh, Big Blend Radio airs Sunday through Friday. Uh, so you can go to bigblendradio.com for the schedule and times. Uh, if you can't listen as the shows go live, you can listen later on demand. All the links are there for whatever outlet you want to listen through. If it's iTunes, Spreaker, YouTube, uh, Stitcher, Player.fm, it's all there. And uh, we've got some music, special music for Alan. This is Before the Rain Falls. It's from acclaimed guitarist John Durant. He's awesome. He's based in Massachusetts, but he loves to hop over to Willamette. Am I saying that correctly? That you are. That's exactly I, right. Yeah, he, he goes over there, you know, once or twice a year, maybe more. He loves food and wine. He should become a travel writer because his food looks amazing. He should. He should join IFTWA. He should. Yeah. I know. I'm just going to recruit him right on this show. But there an incredible guitarist. This whole album is him playing guitar and nobody else. This is all him. Solo guitar album. It's called Parting Is. And uh, before the rain falls, that's something that they, everybody wants to run out and do things in the area. And all I'm saying is I'm playing this not just because of the rain part of it or the before the rain falls. He has whale sounds in here. That's all I'm saying. That's just another reason to play it. So everyone, go get the album. It's Parting Is by John Durant. John with no H. And you can go to johndurant.com for that. Thank you so much for joining us, Alan. Thank you for having me. It was fun. Yeah, always. Thank you. you take care. Thank you. Thank you. Here it is, everyone, Before the Rain Falls. 